This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. So thanks very much uh, for, for, for coming tonight, um, for Carl Avery, um, who's going to talk to us about Philippe Ken and the Vivarium Studio, the ecology of the image. So I think most of you here know about uh, Carl's work. Um, he's published on Jean Genet, uh, notably with Claire Finbra, on sacred theatre, um, walking, writing, and performance. Um, he also works on um, contemporary theatre more generally, and on Lone Twin, and he worked with Lone Twin as well as well. No, on just, yeah, yeah, yeah just worked just on them. On them, and also uh, a special issue of performance research on foot with Nick Weibrow, um, lists among publications, and I'm really excited to have uh, Carl here today. Um, we first collaborated, I guess, uh, that's right, a number of years ago, but without actually meeting, so today it's been being quite special we've got to got to meet so thank you so much uh, for agreeing to be part of these sessions and uh, really looking forward to your well, thanks for thanks appreciate it great so i'll hand yes. hand over to to you okay uh, so i think i know most of these guys really um, i'm not sure i know you. hi Faisal. 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 hi Faisal. i can't know everybody else so part, of part, of the, <laughs> part of the thing yeah. um, so, yeah, uh, I guess this is a bit tricky for me in as much as that I've kind of written this paper before, um, but I'm in the middle of trying to rethink it for, um, for a book that I'm writing for Manchester, which is about, um, it's really about theatre ecology and maybe theatre as a medium for ecology or for thinking and making ecological thought rather than rather than trying to kind of um, think about theatres that deal with ecology explicitly mm -hmm. or that maybe think about eco-activism or that maybe deal with plays about the environment. I'm quite intrigued. I don't think from the, from the really interesting work that's been done in our discipline, I don't think people have really paid huge attention to the medium. Theatre is an ecological medium, so that's what I'm trying, that's what I'm trying to do. And this, I guess, in a way, is part of that, in as much as it looks like, in as much as it deals with theatrical images that Philippe Ken makes. Um, yeah, and I'll just kind of leave that up there, in a way, um, as a way to, I'll just leave that there for, for a bit. Um, what I would like to do, as I go through the paper, is it'll probably last for about an hour, as I'll show little bits of Philippe Ken's work. People haven't really seen much of it, and I'll, I'll put that up. So, okay, um, the paper is really in three bits. It's a kind of general introduction, there's a little bit of something, a bit of a kind of conceptual framework, and then there's a kind of close reading, really, of some of Ken's work um, that I think might well be the methodology that I might adopt for the book between kind of very close readings of things, or close analysis. So, historically, French theatre criticism has tended to focus on textual theatres, canonical directors, political dramaturgies, and key scenographers most of which and whom have been funded by the state. Until recently, relatively little attention, which I'm sure you guys will know, has been accorded to work that adopts an independent and reverent approach to theatre making in terms of theme, form and ethos, and which in doing so deliberately blurs the always fluid boundaries separating theatre from performance or other kinds of live art practice. In the past decade or so, maybe just a little bit more, a series of initiatives by practitioners and programmers, and also some scholars, has meant that audiences in France, and even in the UK, have been introduced to a younger generation of theatre makers, such as Jérôme Bell, Xavier Le Roy, Grand Magasin, Le Chien de Navarre, Super Hamas, Adélie Gorgier, and Gisèle Vienne, some of whom have been in the UK, some of whom haven't. This is a particularly welcome development, I think, since when contemporary French theatre is mentioned and taught, particularly in the Anglophone world, the names advanced are habitually those of Ariane Nushkin, Bernard Marie Cortez, and Patrick Charles. So there's this kind of thing in which contemporary French theatre is still taught and thought of in terms of these people, um, two of whom have, uh, are no longer here, have died, and of course Ariane Nushkin is probably in the 70s or 80s. So it's quite a strange scenario that. 
Um, the company at the heart, or for me at the heart, of this new wave of French performance um, is Philippe Ken and the Valley Studio. Before being appointed to co-run the state-funded Théâtre de Mondier with Nathalie Vimmer in Nanterre in 2014, the Valley Studio toured extensively in Europe and the USA and also Asia, winning an Obie in 2010 for their 2007 piece Le Fait de Serge, a pun of course which I owe to Claire pointing this out on Le Fait de Serge, which is the greenhouse effect. Due no doubt to their aesthetic affinities with experimental performance making in the UK and the US, and due also, no doubt, to their willingness to perform in English. Several essays and articles on the company have started to appear in Anglophone collections, but I haven't actually seen that much in France, bizarrely written about Philippe Ken. I know there was a conference that Chloe was at, but it's quite strange that a lot of it's from Anglophone writing. To date, these writings have been largely introductory in nature and have sought to familiarise English-speaking readers or spectators with the formal qualities of Ken's theatre his interest in the everyday, which is an article by Chloe Deschery, his desire to de-dramatise the stage, and his concern with the practice of lo-fi bricolage, which the US critic Edward Turk refers to as geek chic. Although my own essay reflects this emergent interest in Ken's work, it does so, I think, by adopting a different perspective. For me, the originality of Ken's work is not to be found in its form alone. One is only to glance at Hans Thies Lehmann's panoramic text, Post Dramatic Theatre, to see how its playful aesthetic is shared by many of today's innovative theatre artists, but rather for me in how it combines form with content to interrogate what Ken explicitly refers to in the dossier de presse pour l'effet de Serge as des problématiques qui nous habitent, which is part of this quote here. And I'll just kind of move on a little bit with this. Um, well, I never read, I haven't used this system before. So here's um, a new piece of scripture, La Nuit de Nuit de Tour. Ken's usage of the verb habite is important. It suggests that the problematique he is talking about are not extraordinary problems to be solved through some higher act of synthesis. Rather, they are micro-problems, enmeshed in the banality of the quotidian in the way we might go about our daily business. In Ken's work, as I will show, the most pressing everyday dilemmas that we now face for him are environmental, global warming, industrial pollution, ecological catastrophe, migrations of people, forced migrations of people, species extinction, I could go on. In order to explore these questions, Ken deliberately avoids the sensationist and dystopian strategies used by the mainstream media in many films. In these movies, ecology and environment are used as a backdrop often for human stories. The difficulty here is that the, the difficulty of this approach is that human beings again tend to take centre stage. And so the sort of anthropocentrism or the human exceptionalism that has done so much to contribute to the ecological predicament we find ourselves in remains unchallenged. To circumvent these contradictions, and thus to prevent his own theatre from being negated through the medium in which it is communicated, Ken attempts rather to create an environmental capacity, founded on environmental theatre founded on the capacity, the plastic and synthetic capacity of the scenographic image to generate ecological thinking on its own terms. In Ken's work, human beings are often displaced from the very centre of the site, the theatre, where they have historically sought to reflect on their actions since in antiquity. In their place, Ken substitutes a biocentric aesthetic of systems, processes, and environments. By doing so, Ken argues what is arguably, in contemporary black box theatre circles at least, one of the most sustained and striking reflections on what it means to live in an age of environmental crisis. And I just would like to just come out of this for a second and just maybe show you something in, um, just so you can get a sense really of what his theatre, oh it's in this one isn't it, of what his theatre looks like. That will be in here. Yeah, or did he, there was something in there as well. 
This is, um, I was going to show that a bit later. Oh, but they, yeah, um, I wonder where they've gone. Um, they were there. They were in Chrome. <laughs> they were in Chrome, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hang on. Uh, sorry. That's okay. Uh, I'll just put this yeah. in and we can I don't quite know where they've gone. But yeah, I'll just show you a bit of small club if that's okay. Shifted with the 
kind of focus on performance study. But I think it's still very much there. That such a closed formalist approach is untenable or severely limit limiting with respect to the environmental meaning of Ken's work is evident by providing a cursory glance at the ecological themes of his theatre. His first piece with the Valium studio, Les Démangeaisons des Ailes of 2003, deconstructs human exceptionalism by highlighting the role of metaphor and allegory in our desire to become animal. This experience of 2004 represents a kind of stupefaction and denial in the face of climate change and environmental risk. D'après nature, both after and according to nature, a play which defines itself as une fable écologique, shows performers exiting the stage on a ladder in an attempt to repair the hole in the ozone layer. L'Effet de Serge offers a gentle metatheatrical investigation into the meaning of recycling in a world of overconsumption and built-in obsolescence. Big Bang or Big Bong provides a mock heroic narration of the evolution of the universe in just over one hour ten minutes in a manner reminiscent of Italo Calvino's brilliant short stories or cosmic comics. Swamp Club of 2012 stages a magical attempt as we just seen by a strange collection of artists and animals to save an urban art centre from the threat of developers and real, real estate agents. And Le Nuit de Tour, opening in June 2006 in Brussels, or May 2006 in Italy, deconstructs Plato's anti-theatrical critique of the cave in the Republic by locating itself within an underground grotto where human beings have been replaced by giant moles. Ken's obvious concern with the environment is apparent in two other formats, too. I'm thinking here of the series of cartoon-like text, image, public, text image publications he's been publishing since 2005. Simple thoughts about the presence of nature in urban environments, a few action in natural environments, and thinking about the end of the world in costume by the sea. In the first two of these hilarious but oddly disturbing books, the cast of the Valium studio playfully stumble through the suburb of Meny le Blanc in northwest Paris, looking stunned in the presence of urban nature. In the second publication, they dress incongruously as astronauts and pose for a monthly photograph on deserted beaches and seaside benches, while the surf seems to lap indifferently around them. Second, and more explicitly this time, Ken is involved in a collaboration with Bruno Latour and 200 students from, from Sciences Po in the three-day Théâtre Negociation event that was held at the Théâtre des Mondiaux in late May 2015. The aim behind this event was to preempt thinking on the tragically slow reaction time of governments and policymakers to global warming in advance of the COP21 talks that took place in Paris in December 2015. But what, for all of this, is Ken's background? Taking a hiatus from his work as a sonographer with the director Robert Cantarella, Ken founded the Valium studio whilst devising Le Démageuse en Désert in 2003 and has worked with the same group of performers ever since. With the exception of Guetta en Fourche, the cast of the Valium studio are not trained actors and show little interest in honing their performance skills. The amateurish quality of the performers, he calls them models as opposed to actors suits Ken's needs. As a sonographer in the lineage of Edward Gordon Craig, Adolf Apia, and Robert Wilson, he's more interested in creating a form of theatre based on performed images, stage pictures, or tableau vivant, than in developing a dramatic narrative in which actors represent characters. Ken's aesthetic, as the name of the company suggests, is an aesthetic of the Vivalium, an enclosed space with the behavior of organisms in their environment is observed through a glass wall for the purposes of scientific research. Significantly, in the publicity for Le Nuit de Tup, Ken, referring surely to Felix Guattari's Three Ecologies, frames his vivarium aesthetic as un théâtre écosophique, éco écosophique an ecosophical theater. Ken's Vivalium offers a very different experience of environmental theatre than the one commonly associated with companies such as the Performance Group and Théâtre du Soleil. Usually environmental theatre is considered as a type of immersive theatre 
in which the traditional distance between performers and spectators has been collapsed, and where the action takes place in numerous sites within the playing space. By contrast, Ken's theatre always insists on separation and frontality. His aim is not to overwhelm spectators with an ecstatic experience of space, but to explore how small groups of human beings exist within and relate to their own ecosystems or habitats. More often than not, this leads Ken to locate his performances within makeshift apartments or studios. By doing so, ecology, a word whose etymology combines the Greek oikos, meaning home, with logos, meaning science, study, and law, forms the bedrock of Ken's practice, its zero degree, to borrow a phrase from Chloe Dishery. Before any action is performed then, Ken's use of space invites audiences to consider what it means to live at home and to think of domesticity as something that exceeds the limits of the human house. This is well illustrated in Dapre Nature, where the stage is split into two related playing areas. On the left-hand side of the stage, there is a room with musical instruments, a cooker, a table, and a plasterboard wall covered over with a trompe oil landscape poster. While on the right-hand side of the stage, the audience is presented with a forest of real trees and shrubs that the performances that the performers water, wander through, and take care of. Crucially, there is no distinction made between the two spaces. Both are part of the oikos, as expanded biosphere. Although there is a powerful desire on Ken's part to interrogate pressing sociological issues, his treatment of these issues is invariably ludic and light-hearted. He has no interest in imposing an ideology or in subordinating theatre to the communication of some environmental message. Rather, for him, aesthetic and political emancipation, as well as environmental thinking, form part of the same agenda. In this degree, Ken, irrespective of his rejection of the theatrical canon, inherits the ethos of théâtre populaire, which from Jacques Copeau to Jean Villard through to Antoine Vitesse, has historically sought to fulfil a social mission. In this tradition, as many of you doubtless know, formal experimentation is not subordinated to political expediency. Ken's fidelity to this double lineage sets him apart from the majority of black box theatre makers interested in eco-politics in the UK and North America. With the exception of Go Island, an experimental theatre collective from Chicago, ecology is tended to be the preserve of playwrights and participatory performance makers who have invested in what the US critics Wendy Ahrens and Theresa May call eco-dramaturgy. As Ahrens and May explain it, this is a type of theatre making that, typically and explicitly, puts ecological reciprocity in community at the heart of its theatrical and thematic intent. And that's a quote from Aaron's and May. With Ken and the Valiam studio conversely, ecological significance is elliptical and enigmatic, forged through the effervescent play of the theatrical image. In light of the pictorial dimension of Ken's theatre, there is, little import in trying to, there is little point in trying to grasp its ecological import by reading it discursively or by analysing what the words say. Ken's actors speak very little, and there doesn't appear to be much in the text to talk of. A more apposite method, then, is to observe Ken's worth, works, both live and recorded, and to reflect on how he composes the ecological image in and through the flux and flow of the performance event itself, through, that is, its duration. Yet I think before we do that, it's necessary to explain the conceptual framework that contends the type, that subtends the title of this talk. This is an important move to make, since I do not want to confuse my usage of the term ecological image in this essay with Susan Sontag's reference to an ecology of images, or indeed with what the visual theorist Andrew Ross is called images of ecology. That is to say, those images which from the blue marble photograph of the Earth taken by the crew of Apollo 17 in 1972, through to more recent pictures of sublime nature and environmental disaster, have tended to mediate and inform our practices of ecology. So before I do that, I'm just going to go back again 
and maybe show you a little bit more of Wolf Philippe Ken's work, if that's okay. So this is L'Effet de Serge. <laughs>
this is an image from Big Bang, Big Bong. Uh, Go down to the bottom row. Yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah, great. Okay, um, so I'd like to just talk a little bit now about just some of the ideas behind the title for the paper. So in the last sentence of a 1977 collection on photography, Susan Sontag suggests that if there can be a better way for the real world to include the one of images, it will require an, an ecology, not only of real things, but of images as well. So I'll say that again. If there can be a better way for the real world to include the one of images, it will require an ecology, not only of real things, but of images as well. Sontag's anxiety, her call for a conservationist remedy for photography, is caused by the fact that for her, as for as we know with Gita Bohr and more recently Giorgio Agamben, images have the capacity to erode the real and so facilitate post-industrial capital's obsession with spectacle and discipline. She says, cameras define reality in the two ways essential to the workings of an advanced industrial society, as a spectacle for the masses and as an object of surveillance for rulers. Sontag's critique, although pivotal in expanding the field of eco-criticism to think about images and not simply words or poetry, is however limited. First, her, her ambivalence towards the eye means that she understands the, the means that she underestimates the power of images to counter their role as technological recruits in the war against environmental reality. So she underestimates the role of the image. And this is from Andrew Ross. Second, by using ecology as a metaphor for thinking about human society, she overlooks how images mediate and so determine our relationship with the environment itself. As Franco Berardi notes, the repertoire of images at our disposal limits, exalts, amplifies or circumscribes the forms of life and events that through our imagination we can project onto the world, build and inhabit. So again, a different possibility of the image is not solely negative. The philosopher Michel Serre advances an alternative approach to the ecology of the image, and one that has close affini affinities with how I use the term. In Malfaisance, Appropriation Through Pollution, Serre proposes that pollution be understood in terms of a dialectic between hard and soft forms of toxicity. By the hard, I mean on the one hand solid residues, liquids, gases emitted through the atmosphere by big industrial companies or gigantic garbage dumps, the shameful signature of big cities. By the soft, tsunamis of writing, signs, images and logos, logos flooding civic, public and natural spaces, as well as the landscape that they're advertising. Drawing the ideas of thinkers such as Gregory Bates and Felix Guattari, both of whom in their different ways posit the importance of developing either an ecology of mind or a mental ecosophy, Serre proposes a non-metaphorical reading of the ecology of the image. For Serre, images do not simply function like <coughs> natural or natural ecosystems in some conceptual sense, as Sontag supposes. Rather, they tend to be homologues of ecosystems, transversal operators, impacting materially on how humans exist within the natural world, as well as with each other. Sayer's views on soft or visual pollution are close here to those of the climatologist Mike Hume and the environmental geographer Joe Smith, both of whom believe that the, perils, that the perilous state of things requires nothing less than a new cultural politics. The importance that Smith and Hume attach to aesthetics in their environmental thought highlights the fact that a progressive ecology is never solely about conserving the natural environment, although that, of course, is a part of it. It's about creating a transformation in human thought and perception above all else. But how does this relate to Ken's theatre? Sarah again provides a vital link. In his reading of one of Goya's paintings, Fight with Cudgels, in which two combatants are depicted fighting grotesquely in a pool of mud. Sam points out how our attention is habitually, is habitually drawn to the pair of enemies brandishing sticks. Who will die, we ask? Who will win, they are wondering, 
And that's the usual question. That's from Sarah. From Sarah's point of view, such questions are misleading. By focusing all our attention on the human drama, we forget the mud in, on, in and on which the action takes place and which the fight is beginning to destroy. For Sarah then, our predilection to be polluted by images extends to theatre itself. In Sayre's view, theatre has no interest in the world in general. It is concerned only with heroes knee-deep, like Goya's protagonists, in what he calls spilled blood. And this is what Sayre says, ostensibly talking about theatre. Take away the world around the battles, keep only conflicts or debates thick with humanity and purified of things, and you obtain stage theatre, the interesting spectacle they call cultural. And then he goes on to say, our spectacular culture abhors the world. Sayre's contention may well highlight the environmental shortcomings of traditional theatre. However, it ignores to its cost the development of an alternative mode of theatre practice that has been in circulation since the end of the 19th century. As the US critics Bonnie Maranka and Eleanor Fuchs attest in their readings of Maurice Maeterlinck, Gertrude Stein and Robert Wilson, they see these as being part of the symbolist lineage. Symbolist theatre challenges the privacy accorded to human culture by cultivating an interest in landscape, a static, non-dramatic form of performance where nothing much happens and where the world is perhaps celebrated rather than abhorred. In the work of Metalink and Stein, the spectatorial eye is no longer focused on human agents alone, but on alternative perceptions of space and time on how, that is, signs, bodies and systems interact as an ecosystem. Theatre inspired by symbolism is ecological, not because it represents the natural world, but because it sensitises spectators, and here I quote Fuchs, to a systems awareness that moves sharply away from the ethos of competitive individualism towards a vision of the whole. So the idea here is that ecological potential is not found in conflict. It's found otherwise. The image, as Maranka proposes in her landmark publication, The Theatre of Images of 1977, plays a central role in symbolism's ecological aesthetic, since by expanding the audience's capacity to perceive, it invites it to enter sensual worlds, which break down the parameters of human experience, which we have too hastily accepted. That's from Maranka. As opposed to Sontag, then, who mistrusts images, and Serre, who mistrusts theatre. Maranka and Fuchs believe that the theatrical image can become a site for a different form of looking, perceiving, and thinking. And again, I'd just like to go back and just show you a little bit of what I'm just going to talk about now, which is, oh, I've got to come out there, which is Le Demagaison, which is a difficult word to say, des um, so let me just see. This is La Démangeaison des Ailes, or the Itching of Wings. DVD as well. Yeah. It's that one there. Ah, this one here. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yes.
avez assisté à la démonstration d'un simulateur de vol, je vous explique un peu comment ça va se passer, je vais mettre deux gens dans les explications des capteurs sensoriels qui vont me permettre de, en bougeant, de faire bouger à mon moi virtuel, si je veux dire, quand on sur un écran. Bon, ça c'est la vraie chose, je commence à être un peu classique. Mais ce qui est le plus particulier, c'est que sur les données, vous verrez les capteurs sensoriels, soit un peu plus, soit un peu plus, soit un peu plus, soit un So I'm just going to let that run. You can see what's going on. Gaetan um, in the booth is reading out a series of philosophical texts. And this guy, whose name I don't know, is about to do, which you'll see a little kind of, um, he's about to try and fly. In the Demoges on Dizelle, the stage is divided into three distinct poor stones. Upstage left, a performer wearing knee pads and a visor attempts absurdly to fly by projecting his digital image via a kind of old-fashioned motion capture monitor onto a screen. At the same time, in the middle of the stage, a performer in everyday clothes stands in a flexi-glass booth and laconically reads out a list of books on birds and flying through a microphone. The simultaneity of the action is intensified later in the play where a series of short filmed interviews reflecting on philosophical and aesthetic notions of flight are screened onto a wall. The speakers include a philosopher expatiating on the significance of the phrase, the itching of the wings, in Plato's Phaedrus, a dentist-come-model enthusiast who makes bird prototypes, a reformed drug addict who discusses the crane prose in Tai Chi, a poet who links flight with aesthetico-political liberation, and an installation artist who explains the logic of Ken's dispersed dramaturgy through Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari's notion of the riser. As these layers interweave and interlace, a rock band set up their instruments in preparation for a song in the booth, while a performer constructs a homemade suit of fe feathers, which he will dance in at the very end of the piece, as the credits roll. The thickness of the sonography is further accentuated by the following, musical interviews from Carmen Stockhausen, Leo Ferre, and Zizi Jornet, a long citation on the cosmic energy, on the cosmic significance of energy waves, from Ilya Kabakov's multimedia work, The Man Who Flew Into Space from His Apartment, a voiceover from an art historian narrating the meaning of Bruegel's painting landscape, The Fall of Icarus, and the appearance of a black Labrador, brilliantly called Elnis, whose owner, whose owner Rodolphe Ote, takes off his shoe, attaches two strips of white tape to its soul, and reminisces about seagulls in La Havre. In Le Dommages en Désert, as indeed in all of Ken's performances, images are not distinct, sharp, or delineated. They are porous and promiscuous, always ready to couple with and bleed into each other. As a consequence, perception is never fixated upon a single object. It is open-ended, aware of connections and dependencies and interdependencies. The subject who is placed at the center of this open field, this accumulative play of ecosystems, is invited to engage in a different type of spectatorship, encouraged to let the eye and thought wander from fragment to fragment, sensation to sensation, perception to perception. Theatrical meaning here is no longer tied to the identification of the character, as in Diderot's comments on absorption in his salon texts. Rather, it emerges from the chaotic play of multiple systems that work ecologically to show how no object or being can ever exist in isolation. In La Démagésion des Ailes, four mirrors content, for what all of the images in the piece cover us to show is the extent to which supposedly unique forms of human experience, such as love and freedom, are mediated through metaphors and analogies that lie in the realm of the non or more than human, in an interstitial space where human beings can become different than what they think they are. If the ecological significance of the Demangeson des Ailes is found in the way it collapses any easy distinctions between the animal world and the human world, then the images in Des Experience, Ken's second production of the Valium Studio, heighten our ecological sensibility by including what the theatre, as opposed to site-specific performance, is often thought, and perhaps too hastily thought, to exclude nature, the elements, the outside world. 
Critically, though, nature is not represented in experience as a figure, some mimetic depiction of a natural object. On the contrary, it emerges from the play of imagistic forms. Does experience start with the performer in white, over in white overalls assembling a small fountain from a plastic tub and a green hose pipe, while Hermes, the dog again, and a group of four perplexed but curious performers watch him silently going about his business? Nothing is explained, no words spoken. Rather, the spectators are confronted with a series of images that unfold in real time and space. The group of four performers change places. One of them takes off his shirt and plays the flute. Text is projected on the wall. A statue of a peacock revolves on a plinth above the fountain. Three of the performers play the theme tune from Stanley Kubrick's film 2001 A Space Odyssey. Two new performers, a man and a woman this time, enter the space wearing mountaineering suits and roll on the floor. The other performers bring on a number of easy-to-assemble blue tents and climb into them. A photographer takes a picture of the scene. The lights go down and come back on. The fountain is drained, disassembled, carried away. The performers exit along with Elmi's, and the final image leaves the spectators gazing at a stage full of empty plastic tents. But what does this series of random images have to do with nature? In the words of Theodore Adorno, this experience is like nature precisely because it abstains from representing it. And this is a quote from Adorno. The more strictly artworks abstain from the replication of nature, the more the successful ones approach it. This is because, Adorno argues, nature and art are both instances of the non-human, the non-identical, the enigmatic, the mute, things that cannot in any way be willed. As such, for Adorno, if art wants to engage with nature, it has no real need to go outside of itself. Rather, it is better served exploring its own formal capacities, insisting on its own plastic language. In this experience, Ken attempts to speak the language of nature by refusing to portray it. Specifically, he invests in a dramaturgy of evocation and accumulation in which the visual energy of the piece, the movement of enigmatic images weaving in and out of each other, exists as a type of weather. In this experience, rhythm, intensity and pace are more important for the total atmosphere they create than for the world they might seem to represent. The whole point of the piece, and this is inherent in its title, is to create a temporal art of affects, intensities, atmospheres and moods, intangibles. In this respect, the performance is aptly described in what, in terms of what the dramaturg and writer David Williams calls an environment in process, a field rather than an object. That is, a meteorological event in which the anonymous, unspeakable forces of weather unpredictability, randomness, unfinishability are destratified and expressed in different materials. In a materialist reading of Adorno, Deleuze and Guattari would call this destratification of experience a freeing of the molecular. The deliquescence of Ken's images, the sense in which they rhythmically and materially melt in and out of each other without origin or end, allows theatre to exist as an allegon to the weather and to realise what Adorno calls the language of what is not human through the human language of art. Importantly, Ken not only makes theatre porous by freeing the molecular from one strata to another, he seems to place it in his experience at the heart of a great planetary, perhaps even cosmic network, in which matter moves, shifts, alights, and consolidates in time and space before shifting elsewhere. Ken is concerned to create ecological images that would challenge the traditional humanist focus of theatre, helps to explain why language, especially spoken language, is relegated to such a minor role in his dramaturgy. Like Robert Wilson, Ken realises that dialogue, the traditional raison d'etre of Western drama, compromises the power of the image by suggesting that the truth of the world lies elsewhere, in the metaphysics of the word, the logos made flesh, the articulate soul of some hero. In this experience, that they nature, big bang, and l'effet de serge, for instance, little or nothing is said by the performers. 
In Dante Natura, the performers cook a meal, play a western, country and western song with guitars, water the small forest on the right hand side of the stage, take instructions about where to stand for the reenactment of Bruegel's painting, The Blind Eating the Blind, dress up as astronauts and then leave the stage on a ladder. Similarly, in Le Fait de Serge, the audience watches Guiton Fauche, who plays Serge, construct and rehearse the small micro-scale performances he exhibits to his friends and neighbours every Sunday. And in Big Bang, the cast playfully and silently stage the story of evolution from the Big Bang onwards, from the most mundane of materials, a black plastic sheet, fake beards, an elastic and electric cooker, and a plastic dinghy. There is no drama or conflict to speak of here. All the attention is focused on group behaviour. In these ensemble pieces, Ken invites the audience to look differently, to adopt what we might call a properly ecological vision. The more we gaze at these human beings in front of us, the less exceptional the human species appears. The performers appear as animals, caught between first and second nature, no different in essence from the behaviour we might observe if we were to study the ecology of a colony of ants through a microscope or in a vivarium. However, for all the emphasis he places on observation and research, Ken's commitment to the visible does not result in scientific knowledge. The gaze of the spectator always stumbles on the objects it looks at and is rebutted by the resistant opacity of the stage that refuses to disclose its secrets. In that plain nature, no explanation is given for why the cast should be concerned to restage Bruegel's painting. The situation is and remains enigmatic. The apparent gratuity of the image, its sheer facticity, its surface, provokes questions, encouraging the audience to engage in its own act of interpretation. Is the reference to Bruegel hopeful or absurdist? Are we as blind as the figures depicted? Is la chute inevitable, as they say, or can we repair the ozone layer? The ecological hermeneutic operation that Ken's images provoke, their appeal to be in interpreted environmentally, is ultimately what separates his concept of theatre ecology from that of his symbolist predecessors. For whereas Metterlink and Stein dethrone human exceptionalism by experimenting with a landscape or neo-pastoral aesthetic, Ken positions the abstract quality of his images within a recognisable environmental context. This positioning does not take place on the mimetic level by developing a representational scenario or story or fable within the piece. Rather, it proceeds by way of juxtaposition and montage, silently commenting on the action from without. In Experience and D'après Nature, Ken uses projected text to evoke a world, an outside, beset by environmental crisis. In Des Experience, the text is an alphabetical listing of actual eco-disasters, toxic spills, and failed summit meetings. The Exxon Valdez, the greenhouse effect, Bhopal, Chernobyl, Kyoto, Rio. And in Dacme Nature, the work combines dialogue, quotations, and instructions to describe a society that appears to be gently drifting, sleepwalking, towards une douce fin du monde. One of the consequences of juxtaposing text to image in these plays is to problematize the temporal and so ontological status of the world observed through Ken's Vivarium. Ultimately, it is impossible to know if the world is stumbling blindly, sans fracas, en douceur, towards ecological apocalypse, or if the ecological apocalypse has already happened. By fashioning an enigma, Ken creates a sense of ambivalence that is never resolved. Viewed from one perspective, the work seems to exist as a kind of collective nightmare, a soporific calmness that dispels any need for action. Looked at differently, however, and this holds for most of Ken's work, a sense of optimism, un peu d'espoir, emerges. The generosity of the performers, their desire to, amuse, their desire to amuse each other, is suggestive of an alternative value system rooted in small acts of creative resilience that gesture towards the possibility of establishing de nouveaux rapports de l'homme et de la nature menacée, a 
and that's from Dapre Natur. The coexistence of two competing value systems in Ken's theatre, their mixity of hope and futility, infuses his image with what can only be called a sense of irony. In an important way, this is exactly as it should be. For if ecology, as I've been arguing in this essay, displaces the human from the center of the world, then it is crucial that a suitable form of representation is constructed. One that takes the fate of humanity seriously, but perhaps not too seriously. An art that allows us to think of the world in terms other than the dramatic anthropocentrism of spilled blood. Ken's images for me are ecological images precisely because they show humans as both central to and superfluous to the fate of the planet. In them, the absurdity and melancholy of our ecological predicament is recognized without for all that being mined the catastrophic or melodramatic ends. Although Ken wants to make us active spectators instead of passive consumers, he does not provide images that, de that would demythologize the social imaginary in the hope of discovering some redemptive truth. Rather, he supplies us with soft images, images that we can think with, images that we assemble and piece together for ourselves. It is no coincidence that the phrase le futur qui nous attend et celui que nous créons should be repeated on several occasions in d'après nature. For to produce a, a future on these terms is maybe to engage in a process of what Roland Barthes calls practical composition. A willingness on the spectator's part not only to recognize the connectivity that defines ecosystems, but to play with these systems, to recycle them differently. While many theatre critics today interpret co-composition in terms of a distinctly Puritan, almost Marxian concept of the labor of the spectator, I prefer to return to Barthes' own vocabulary and to think instead in terms of the anarchism of pleasure, of what Kristen Ross has recently called communal luxury in her book on the Paris Commune. Indeed, to tease out the ecological implications that are everywhere in Ross's text, it might be that a shift from labor to pleasure, from work to play, is the very thing that transforms an effet de serre into an effet de serge, a gentle affirmation of the world that is never without a certain hint of sadness, the same disquiet that haunts the aged rockers whose car is broken down in the field of snow that we saw in Ken's 2010 production of La Melancholie du Trémont. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs>